Um, my name is Mark Williams, and I am a fellow, I'm a lawyer by training, I'm a member of the Park Center for Human Rights, Water, and Sanitation. And i um, been planning an introduction for, for Larry today. I um, recall a story about yesterday, I was chatting with a friend um, about education, and I said, you know, just, I was talking about Larry's talk, and it makes me laugh as a lawyer, I went through three years of lawyering uh, you know, training and not one class on negotiation. And um, I just find that fascinating and in hindsight. <laughs> depressing. <laughs> depressing and do whatever. Uh, right. um, uh. Larry is a very uh, special individual in that he combines um, teaching at MIT and at Harvard Academia and also practice. Um, he just told me he just got back from Chile negotiating a lot of issues down there. So when he speaks, he, he knows what he speaks of, and it's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. And on a personal note, um, he's a, a very generous and kind person, Shamala, who is unfortunately not able to be here today. We got a very shortened grant to go study the Israeli Bedouin water situation. And Larry, at the last minute, very kindly offered several hours of his time, and his advice and guidance was indispensable in making that trip a success. So, once again, thank you. And sure. Very honored and appreciative of you being here today. Thanks for the invitation. There are uh, any number of different directions that I thought of going in the brief presentation I'm going to make. Um, I sent along two articles. I don't know if people got to look at them or not. One deals with um, water negotiations between Israel and Jordan, and the other focuses much more generally on uh, what does it mean to be committed to democratic decision making, but also be focused on water issues. And um, I thought I would focus on water and democracy, if that's okay. Um, negotiation comes into the story. Uh, but um, I'm happy in, in conversation uh, after I make my short presentation to talk either about Chile, which um, I, I was saying uh, this is a wonderful uh, I issue, uh, I'll focus on Latin America that's just come out, but Chile is not in the, didn't make it into the, into the story. Um, the hydro conflicts in Chile right now are really, um, substantial, and I'm happy to talk about that issue on Middle East water, uh, as people like. Um, with my colleague Shafiq Islam at Tufts, uh, we have a new PhD program in water diplomacy at Tufts that combines between the engineering school and the Fletcher School of Diplomacy, um, trying to build a field of water diplomacy. Um, we also have support from the National Science Foundation for something called the uh, Research Coordination Network in Water Security. And uh, the, uh, it's an effort to pull together 20 or 30 research centers around the world all working on water conflict and trying to see if we can share ideas and see what's similar and different. And out of that work has um, emerged something that you can look at online called the Aquapedia which is an effort to collect in a kind of open source fashion stories of water conflict around the world but in order to make them useful for researchers there's kind of a template set of questions and it says if you have a water conflict and you want to describe it you got to do it by answering all these questions and attaching certain things and then the software turns that into a case and then all the cases are common and tagged in the same way so that scholars can look across them. Uh, so uh, there are about 30 cases so far that have been entered. We're hoping to get into the hundreds in the next 12 months, uh, but you can look at that uh, online, uh, either at, uh, by looking at uh, waterdiplomacy.org and then looking at the Aquapedia section, or just, I think if you Google Aquapedia, it should, should show up. Um, so I, I'm happy to come back around and talk about any of those that you might like. Um, this piece, uh, Water and Diplomacy, is uh, prompted by reactions to the book that Shafiq and I wrote called Water Diplomacy that came out last year. Um, not unexpected, 
reactions as we sort of put a, stuck our chin out and waited to see if anyone wanted to take a swing at us. Uh, the first thing we said is uh, water is not a scarce resource. Um, we said water is a flexible resource. And if you have two countries fighting about water, but they could figure out how the water could be used by one in one way and then used by the second in a different way, you double the amount of water and the problem isn't scarcity, the problem is that the relationships between the countries are such that they're not able to talk about using technology together or setting up mechanisms for jointly managing the shared resource. They're so busy fighting about who has what right to it and then they waste a substantial portion of what they had a right to and the other wastes a substantial portion of what they had a right to. So we wanted to get at this issue by making the claim that water is not a scarce resource, it's a flexible resource. Um, the second thing we said uh, in the book is that um, the allocation of water shouldn't be trusted to engineers. Uh, we knew that would get a reaction. We basically took on the concept of integrated water resource management, which basically says draw a line around the water, that's the system, and then lay out what the needs are of the different competing groups and give it to an engineer to optimize. Mm -hmm. And we said, uh, first of all, the amount of water that you think is there because it was there in the past isn't going to be there in the future because climate change is having an effect on how much water there is. So the notion that you have a stable system with a boundary that you can, and then clear needs that can be optimized uh, is wrong in every respect. The amount of water that used to be there won't tell you how much water will be there in the future. Secondly, the boundary for planning purposes isn't the water. It's all the networks of actors and all of the institutions that in any way shape what the way the land near the water gets used or the way the water gets used or the way development happens. And so the boundary isn't around the water body. The boundary is open, not closed, and it's all the networks that are involved. And thirdly, uh, who's to say what the needs are? of all the different stakeholders uh, or all the different users and who's to say that optimization uh, is the goal and that you have a political process for allocation not a an engineering process and that you need to involve the stakeholders in those political choices since optimization from an engineering perspective, which assumes a closed system and a predictable amount of water and some sort of ranking that's obvious of the different claims of the different groups isn't to be found. Well, um, not surprisingly, uh, people who have spent their life committed to the concept of integrated, resource man integrated water resource management on the grounds that this is an efficiency problem uh, and this should be turned over to experts uh, responded strongly and so uh, we've been on a campaign to respond to the responses and took the occasion of the invitation from this uh, the Journal of International uh, Journal of Water Resources uh, Development um, to put this piece together and to be uh, both synoptic but take a little farther the idea that the alternative to turning it over to the engineers is in fact to engage all the relevant stakeholders in a direct problem-solving conversation. It doesn't mean the scientific and technical input isn't important. It means that it's not definitive. It also means that elected and appointed officials are not necessarily the only or the best voices of all of the relevant stakeholder users of particular water resources. And so then the burden was back on us to say, how in any particular situation you could therefore figure out who are the relevant stakeholder groups who can speak for them, how to have them jointly generate the information that they can use to make sense of both the present and make various alternative predictions about the future. And then what is the process by which you can involve large numbers of people with very different levels of technical skill 
and very different competing political interests in a collaborative solving process. And that's what I tried to spell out in this piece, and it's also spelled out um, in uh, Water Diplomacy, but we figured a lot of people would see a review, see those three things we said, not bother reading the book. Uh, maybe we get them at least to read an article, uh, a shorter article in a journal that might be more readily available uh, than a book. Although we did make a fuss with the publisher to make sure the book came out in paperback as well as hardback at the same time, and we had in the contract that the paperback had to be under $30, which is hard to get a commitment to do these days. But nevertheless, um, that's the genesis of this piece, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the ideas of this concept, behind this concept of collaborative, adaptive management and the way you can engage multiple stakeholders in the management of large-scale water resources, including those that cross international boundaries. Um, it just came from being on the phone with the IJC, which is the entity that manages the Great Lakes between the United States and Canada, and uh, half of the members say, you know, we tried this public engagement thing, and it's created nothing but headaches for us, and we have decisions that have to be made, and we just have to backtrack, and we're appointed here by the two governments, we have to make the decisions. And the other half, who are horrified by that idea, and say that, uh, what you've called public engagement all this time, in fact, doesn't meet even the minimum tests of effective, collaborative, adaptive management. No wonder it hasn't produced the results you want. And uh, the last thing we want to do is go backwards and presume these are technical problems or purely political problems to be decided by the formal appointees of governmental entities. And uh, so they say, well, will you, come, will you come next month to our annual meeting of the IJC and, and tell us your sense of what it is we should be doing about public engagement in terms of the management of the Great Lakes and why what we have done so far doesn't meet the test. And of course, their notion of public engagement is almost all one directional information out. We've had so many meetings with so many people and we gave them so much information, and it didn't make it any easier to make the decisions. They just can't get it. And I said, well, one test of public engagement is that it's not only information in one direction. That there needs to be some reaction back. And then they said, well, what do you do with all those different voices? My goodness, all those people claiming different things? That's just going to make our job harder, not easier. I said, well, I'll give you three criteria by which you can judge your or any other public engagement process, and they're embedded in this paper. Um, I said, and I'm happy to come and talk about how to do these three things. First, all the groups that think they're stakeholders need to be able to designate their own spokespeople relative to the particular decisions about the water resource that are being made. And they said, well, then the, you'll have crazy people at the table. <laughs> and I said, if you decide who legitimate spokespeople are of all the groups and they don't decide, the process of engagement falls short of what it's going to take to get to some kind of collaborative problem solving where the result is going to be credible and legitimate in the eyes of the people affected by the decision. You can't do the selecting and appointing of the people who are supposedly the stakeholders from your side of the table. They said, oh, we can't do that. What are the other two? And I said, <laughs> I said well, the, se the second is that there needs to be a process of joint inquiry relative to what the resource is and you need a process of, I would argue, scenario planning. I didn't use that word. You need some procedure for looking ahead jointly with those stakeholder representatives to consider what the possible futures might be relative to the demands on that resource and relative to 
what the resource might look like. I don't talk about prediction because I don't think it's knowable what the future of a resource is going to be in a definitive sense. They're talking about very complex socio-ecological systems. We are terrible at making predictions about these complex networks and what the situation's going to be. But you can lay out a range of possible futures. You can say, if this and this and this happens, then we know enough to say that this is what the situation will look like. And if you can make a portfolio of possible futures, you can then engage the stakeholders, if you had them there, appropriately represented, in thinking about what some of the ways of proceeding are, given their conflicting interests relative to that range of futures. And they said, well, we already have a very elaborate technical <laughs> capacity. We have a forecast of how much water there'll be, what the water quality will be. We have models. Don't you know about computer models? We have models that allow us to forecast. I said, I don't see how you could think they're reliable. Mm -hmm. Because the change that climate change is going to create on these systems and the unexpected events caused by the socio-ecological interactions are such that you're going to get it wrong. Well, just admit you're going to, your prediction is going to be wrong. And then your method is if you can't predict, then there's, nothing, there's no way to have a discussion about what to do. But I'm suggesting you lay out a range of possible futures and look at things you can do that will appear sensible regardless of which of the futures occurs. It's the same thing they tell people about planning for retirement. Mm -hmm. Don't pick one stock and one company and bet on that for your retirement. You should have a diversified portfolio. I mean, the idea is you're protected if you have some diversification. Well, it's the same idea. Given the uncertainties about the future, lay out a multiplicity of possible futures, and then ask, which I'm going to get to my third point, and then ask, which way of moving forward are you likely to have no regrets given whichever of the alternative futures occurs? And for those of you who haven't read about scenario planning, it's going to become the most important tool for people in resource management going forward because we will shortly, I am convinced, abandon the notion that we are so smart we can make predictions about what's going to, what the future holds for socio-ecological systems. Really, given the uncertainty, we really need to have this portfolio of forecasts and there's a wonderful set of methods for doing scenario planning that are beautifully laid out and documented in many sources. But, you know, it just started teaching them in, in public policy and planning and natural resource management schools. We kept imagining we were going to teach people to make models to predict the future. Terrible mistake. Um, so I said the second criterion uh, that the IJC should test its its efforts at public engagement against is whether or not you have a joint process of generating these forecasts that are believable. Believing the, the usefulness of the forecasts, each of which specifies something different, is not the same as having agreement on what you think the future is. So, but if you can generate through a joint inquiry this array, then you can move to the third thing, the third test I suggested was you need to produce some kind of collaborative problem solving. N not, not a negotiated lowest common denominator agreement, but a solution to how to meet the contending interests of the parties represented given the uncertainty in the forecasts. And that what can you do to get all those parties to agree on a way of proceeding given the diversity of interests and the array of futures. And that the product of all the conversation should be a written proposal that people who are part of it commit to support. 
Now, the product is a proposal, not a decision, because any kind of engagement process can only produce something that those with the formal authority to decide get to decide. But it's very different when the people sitting on one side of the table who are the appointed officials in charge say, we gave you some information, you all spoke at the microphone, you all had your say, thank you very much, now we will make the important decisions, as compared to after a year of consultation with a broad group of stakeholders who engaged in a process of joint inquiry and joint problem solving, a package has been pr proposed of actions to take that all those groups sign to say, if this is what the elected body decides, we will all work to support it. Now, it's still the decision of the elected body what it wants to do. You can't preempt their formal statutory authority. But now, if they decide to do something radically different from what that proposal is, they can be held accountable for not meeting what the agreement was, the informed agreement of all the stakeholders. It's very easy under normal consultative public engagement processes for the body in the front to do what it wants. And then someone says, we don't like that. That's not what we said. They said, oh, we had so many different statements from so many different groups. We did our best. We did what we thought was right. We're accountable for doing what we thought was right. But if they had an informed agreement, a proposal in the form of an informed agreement from representatives of all the relevant stakeholder groups, and they said, we decided to ignore that and do something else that our people who appointed us wanted, then they can be held accountable in a very different way. So I described that, and there was silence on the other end of the phone from the IJC. They said, well, it doesn't seem like it leave much of a role for us. We are the elected, we are, we are the appointed commissioners by the, the president and the prime minister of the two countries. You would have us just decide yes or no to do what the, these, this group, kept saying, this group decided? I said, well, what's the basis on which you're going to make your decisions? You have no accountability to all the users? Oh, no, we do. How do you know what they want? We have this public engagement process. I said, no, you don't. Well, we take account of what our big, gigantic, expensive technical staff tells us. So you're just doing the technically correct thing with the water? Because there is no technically correct thing with the water relative to meeting the interests of all the groups. They said, well, we were appointed. We're supposed to take account of all of these different competing pressures. And we're the ones who make the decisions. I said, based on what? How do you know? I said, well, I'll come and I'll describe to you some examples in other places. I can't say there are lots of examples all around the world where what I just described is the case for water management. But I can show you aspects of what I've said beginning to appear both in <laughs> countries and between countries in different places where it is impossible to ignore stakeholder interests or to pretend anymore that you've taken them into account because you had a public hearing. And so we do have illustrations of much more intense collaborative efforts and joint inquiry. Again, not to the degree that I'd like to see and that I hope and expect to see in the future. So it's a puzzle. How should we manage water resources? Whichever scale, whichever part of the world, how should we manage them? Well, elected and appointed people, elected people, appoint appointed people, who are supposed to be responsive to the elected people, who are supposed to be responsive to the electorate, and the appointed people take technical information into account, give it to the elected people, who are supposed to take political in intuition into account, and then if somebody doesn't like it, someone else will get elected in the future and we'll continue to have this rather minimal approximation of what we otherwise could, could assume to be the array of stakeholder interests and some reconciliation of them with scientific and technical concerns where all the participants must take responsibility not only for espousing their interests but also for imagining that you have to meet the interests of the others as well. 
And that's what I call joint problem solving. And it can't replace the activities of elected officials, but it can certainly supplement them in a way that would be quite different from what we're used to. So I think I'll stop there, see whether that provokes any conversation, and, uh, and I'm happy to pick up other subjects as we go. Is that okay? Is that okay? okay, good. I was involved in, in a microcosm of that. How micro? Uh, it was Santa Barbara. Yeah. And uh, we first had an oil problem, and I had a friend just like you, he was a Democrat, I was a Republican. That was a basis for our, our friendship. Later, we had a water short, a water problem, they were calling a water shortage. It became so political. I was meeting with the engineers and everything at my friend's request uh, to, to study it because I really thought state water was the answer. My friend thought desal was the answer. Desal became so um, charged uh, with the idea of tree huggers and, and, and uh, climate change people, even back then, before this really a, a household uh, uh, thought. And, uh, and, and so they had me, the Republican, to talk to the Republican Water Board, and I had all the data. And their response, my buddy Plosner had brainwashed me. They couldn't buy in to the data because it was so politicized. Yep. Not so unlike today's Congress. Yep. Do you, do you find that with some of your... your uh, when you, say, when you say buy into the data, what we have, for the most part, and I was out your way last week with PG&E, because they have a nuclear power plant that's up for relicensing. They have the largest hydro facility in the West, in Eastern California, uh, and they have nothing but unhappy conversations with political and community and environmental and other groups from one end of the state to the other. And at this stage, they're saying maybe we should have a different set of principles that guide how we engage various stakeholders in decisions about how electricity will be produced and distributed. And my sense is that what we have is the, for the most part, is a, the battle of the printout. I mean, we basically have adversary science. So whoever wants to do X hires whatever consultants or technical people or agency people they want and says, I need analysis that proves this. And the other side says, we need to defeat their technical analysis. I need to hire someone who has a history of finding in the favor. I know they're wonderful scientists and technical people, but I will choose those with a history of citing, of producing results that are consistent with what a different group wants. And so we get Republican and Democratic science. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's not necessary. We can have a process of joint inquiry, but it's organized very differently. If we say we have to make a decision about this resource or this location or meeting this need, before anybody decides the answer, we need to put together representatives of all the relevant stakeholder groups chosen by those groups, and then they need to decide what information do we collectively want they need to jointly choose a set of technical consultants to the group. The technical consultants need to be told, not asked, what questions to try to answer. The technical consultants then need to say how they're proposing to answer those questions, but give the prospective users of the results the opportunity to question the choice of methods and assumptions, then this group of technical advisors produces what it's going to produce, and then it has to sit there with the whole group and answer questions about, well, how did you deal with that gap in the data where you couldn't get that and you had to interpolate? What are the 
what is the sensitivity of your result to that assumption? And everybody's listening, not one side. And at the end of that discussion, what you have is a best effort through joint fact-finding where everybody agrees that that's, they understand how what came out came out. They reserve the right to interpret it differently, but it's not contested. The science isn't going to be determinative, or the study isn't going to say, oh, well, then we have to do this. But we're not going to get into the adversary science that becomes a mask over the political debate, which is a debate about different political interests, which I expect, even over natural resource questions, I expect it, but let's have a common body of work, of evidence, and if it's about the future as opposed to the present, then let's lay out this array of possible futures. So when we have people contesting the science, I think it's because we've gone about it in a way that assumes you have no choice but to have adversary science, and the winner is the one with the people who have more letters after their name, or went to a better school, or whatever. But that never, all that does is what we have, what the, all that gets you is what we've got, which is we've demeaned the value of scientific and technical input. We basically just said, well, anybody can get anybody to do any kind of a study, and since that study doesn't help me, I assume all the studiers are corrupt. That's the current climate change debate. But that's the product. We brought it on ourselves. I would think if you get involved in the argument early, great. But two, two problems that, that, that I found. First of all, it's very difficult to get a board to, later in the game anyway, buy off and have the patience to follow this kind of very rational yeah. uh, conversation. Uh, they know uh, uh, what they want. And there was no changing them. And I must say, on the other side, of my friend's side, which was my side at that point, they were pretty locked in, too. And so I, I don't think anyone really thought this board we had, and, and they were fine people, very Republican. And I don't think they were really capable at that point of listening to, to that, uh, and following that level of, 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 of uh, reason. Uh, they knew. I don't think, I don't think that's just true in California. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, was, what was interesting to me was um, PG knows how, PG and E knows how to work the system, right? The, when they put their application into the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they have so many lawyers and so many lobbyists and so many people lined up to do what they think they need to do to get relicensed, right? They pulled the proposal back. I don't know if you know that Diablo Canyon's on hold at the moment. Because the leader, the new, the, I don't know how many times they turned over the leadership at PG&E, but the new leadership said, do we really want to have a 10-year fight in court? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's another way. Now, the openness to the kind of process I'm describing may only come after people have been burned, mm -hmm. after they have spent so much money and so much time in court, where, or they have been forced to spend so much political or social capital that the next thing they want to do becomes impossible, that when things are bad enough, conceivably people are open to this. It's very hard when things are going their way to convince a board, you know, I know you get everything you want whenever you want it, but you should do this in a different way. It's, uh, politically, right? Not going to happen. But what's interesting from my standpoint is, in California, there are literally hundreds of approved renewable energy projects under the renewable portfolio that California has. They aren't going ahead. They have approval. Hundreds can't go ahead. They're all in litigation. They're all being contested by one or another local group. Because even though they got approval, and even though they're renewable energy projects, they did not engage in a process of consultation early enough with groups on all sides so that the decision really represented 
and informed agreement amongst the contending groups. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we have so opened up the rules of standing, this is mm -hmm. your area, in the American regulatory law system, mm -hmm. that almost anybody can bring a suit. They don't have to show that they're personally in any way going to be harmed yeah. by this thing. Used to be, yeah. what are you doing here <laughs> filing a lawsuit? You don't even live here. But I'm part of the group that's part of the group that's part of the group that's concerned about the problem and that might in some way, cons oh, well, by all means, file your suit. <laughs> so I think maybe the cost of contentiousness reaches a certain plateau where then people are open to hearing that maybe there's another alternative. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know about your discussion with the technical people yeah. and the challenges that that brings. Right. Um, I, I'll answer the question directly. You might want to look at something called Science Impact .mit.edu. I've had resources from the USGS, US Geological Survey, for the better part of the last decade. USGS is America's science agency. I don't care what any of the others say. It has more PhDs in science than any other agency of the US government. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, they waited to be asked to do a study. They went off, they did the study, and they mailed in the result. And they had no interaction with whoever asked for the study or whoever needed the results of the study. And they got away with it for a long time. And then Congress was on the verge of zeroing out USGS from the Interior Department budget. Who was their constituency? <laughs> they never engaged the groups who needed their help or who were receiving their help. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, after a whole series of difficulties with the leadership of USGS, the question was maybe there's another way in which science needs to interact with politics and policy, mm -hmm. and USGS supported the creation of the MIT Science Impact Collaborative, in which we have been trying to model this other way and to help train a new generation of scientists, of technical people, mm -hmm. who understand that you can't go hide after you did the study, and you can't expect nobody will come and question you about the assumptions for the methods you're going to use, and that you're not accountable for all of the non-objective judgments required in almost every science-intensive environmental policy study, like how big is the study area for the purpose of the study? That's not a scientific question. How long is the time frame for the analysis that you're going to do? There's no correct answer. Which indicators of impact should you use? I don't care. There's no handbook that's going to tell you that where you look up this type study, use these indicators. How do you amalgamate across the multiple dimensions of impact that you're concerned about? There's not a scientific answer to that. And the results of the study hinge on all of those non-objective judgments. The results are sensitive to those judgments. And if you're not engaging the people who have to believe the results in the way in which you're making those judgments, if you're not accountable for that, then what happened is what's going to keep happening, which people say, ah, that's just one study. We have an alternative study. So studies, in fact, are discounted, and now we get down to it. Who's got the political clout, the Republicans or the Democrats, or the, this side of the river or that side of the river? And that's a terrible result. So the issue is, can we train a generation of scientists not just to communicate their findings? This was my horror at Jane Lubchenco's AAAS presidency. She said, it's all about science communication. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not that people don't understand what you're saying because it's too technical for them. It's that you're not accountable for the non-objective judgments at the heart of science-intensive work. And we need to train a different generation, and I feel I'm responsible at MIT. You know, we sent the new Secretary of Energy this week, right? 
I hope by now he's learned <laughs> that there's a different way of operating than a nuclear physicist would usually operate. And, and I'm also thinking of the generation of existing engineers. Is it too late? <laughs> I think people on the technical side will be incredibly uncomfortable mm -hmm. engaging in the way I just described. But if that's the only way you get the contract, then you will find some new people to put on your staff who will sit in the front. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're doing the work in the back room, the older people will do more of that work, but uh, younger staff will explain to them the, wait a minute, before we get started, we have to lay out our design and then we have to go to this meeting. I'll, I'll go, I'll go. And I can, I know how to have this conversation. It's not, though, about communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of scientists who say, we just need better science journalism. We just need better communication of the science and that'll fix it. Mm -hmm. And that just, to me, begs the important question entirely. I'm an engineer. I actually had these discussions at my former company where everyone would say, engineers just like to see black and white. And they used to like, we are over analytical, jury duty doesn't like us. And I always had, I was always on the other side and I used to say that no, some of us can think across the board, don't, don't typecast me with you. Yeah. And I think um, we can train a new generation of engineers. And oh, I'm optimistic <laughs> about it. You had your hand up. This is a kind of a meta question, but um, the notion that there are value judgments implicit in those research designs, right, um, must be shocking to some people, right? <laughs> I mean, because uh, I've spent some number of decades listening to economists tell me that yeah. cost-benefit analysis. Oh, my economy, favorite subject, yeah. Yeah, I know. Is value neutral, right? And so, um, so I'm really interested in this idea that you can help people see that the definitions that they place on their research or evaluations um, actually are uh, judgments, not necessarily objective criteria. Um, how, how does one actually go about that? Because, yeah. I mean, scientists, uh, I think um, much more so than even economists, really do think that they're working in a world where a fact is a fact. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that you have, over the last several decades, uh, very much at the, um, with the support of people like uh, Sheila Jasanoff here at Harvard, mm -hmm. of the development of Science Technology Society or critical scientific mm -hmm. thinking, which it's not a surprise to them that there are value judgments involved in doing a scientific work. And we have a kind of separate science evaluation or science criticism establishment of very sophisticated scholars. But the scientists still, mm -hmm. they're, they're not affected by that. Mm -hmm. That's over here. It's sort of more in the social science or uh, humanities part of the university, but if you watch what happens with the uh, uh, people in the sciences, they still continue to operate as if they are, in fact, operating in a value-neutral way. And they're shocked, as you say, when somebody challenges that. Now, the story of The Economist is a slightly different story, right? Because we have some social scientists who suffer from science envy and the economists in the lead. And they want to operate like scientists even though what they are operating on is our humans or communities or states that they are terrible at modeling and forecasting about as far as I'm concerned. Now, there are other social scientists who say we're not going to be focused on proving things the way science is. We're going to be focused on knowing things, which is what social science can allow you to do. And you can know those things in conjunction with communities and groups that have to make decisions, but it will be their decisions and you will have to interact with those people in context-dependent ways. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the economists continue to try to operate like scientists who are trying to look for universal truths and to be able to make context-independent statements, right? But since they are writing about and studying people <laughs> and communities and organizations, I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a false goal. It's a false search. They're not going to be able to do it. And the more they try to pretend that they can make universal statements in a context-independent way, being science-like, by which they mean being completely detached from, independent from, the people, and communities, groups, and entities that they're studying, the more harm they're going to do, right? And you mentioned cost-benefit analysis, and from my standpoint, and this is certainly not original with me, we can point out all the non-objective judgments that are absolutely central to being able to do cost-benefit analysis. And if you say, I'm, I'm, I'm just a scientist, I'm just an economist doing cost-benefit analysis, I can't help the way it comes out, I'm not responsible for the way it comes out. Well, of course you're responsible. <laughs> we say costs compared to benefits. Costs to whom? Oh, the costs are to the average person times the number of people. But what if I'm most concerned about a subset of the people? Well, I could do a separate cost-benefit for analysis for that. But you don't. You do a cost-benefit analysis for a place as if all the interests of all the people are equal, the same, average, but that's not the case. And when you say, well, it's true, we had a tough time figuring out the value of that forest mm -hmm. in terms of deciding whether that foresting process should go forward or not. So we figured out a proxy measure of the value of the forest. How? The value of the wood sold. Mm -hmm. What about the other uses of the, oh yes, we had other methods of surveying some set of people to get a proxy number for some other attributes of the value of the forest. How did you decide which proxy numbers to use? Who to, what did you ask them? Well, we asked them how much you'd pay not to have the forest torn down. How much you pay per year in a permit to use the forest. And then we multiplied by the number of people that use the forest and that was the value, the use value of the forest other than cutting down the wood. But there's no shortage of things you could have measured. The choice of which thing to measure, what weight to attach to things, how to frame them in time and space, those are all non-objective judgments. They may say, well, we have a handbook of best practices, mm -hmm. so we just didn't do it arbitrarily. Yeah, sure. But in fact, it's arbitrarily on behalf of a group as opposed to arbitrarily on behalf of an individual. So I'm not against doing the analysis, but what I would like is for the people who need to use the analysis to be able to specify different sets of circumstances, and I would like, this is the cost-benefit analysis with these assumptions, these, 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 this is the portfolio of now bring all the people together who have to make the decisions, look them look at the portfolio having agreed that that was produced in a good way, and now, how can you both meet the political interest and take the technical analysis seriously and simultaneously meet as many of the interests of all the groups as possible? What can you conclude? <laughs> That's your proposal to the body that must decide. I know it takes more time, <laughs> but it doesn't take more time, and I know it takes more money, but it doesn't take more time and money, as it turns out, if you measure from the moment you want to do something to the moment you can actually get it all done. It only takes more time from the time you get the inspiration till the time you decide what you think you're going to do. <laughs> then the budget is the legal budget. Then the budget is the uh, budget you spend to get people elected so you can maintain your majority to, in the face of a minority that doesn't like your decision. It's the lobbying budget, it's the political campaign budget, it's the referendum budget in California. If you take all of that into account, the process I'm describing, if it really produces an informed agreement at the point at which you make the decision, is actually less expensive. 
it actually takes less time. It's only, it's, so it's, what are we comparing the beginning and the end point and the dollar cost to? But elected people have only the current term. Mm -hmm. That's their time frame. And unless all the constituents push for the long term framing of what their concerns are, they'll make, they'll say, I don't have time for this. I have to get the decision made while I'm still in office. I said, why? Well, because I want to make the decision while I'm still in office. Said, well, okay, but the next person is going to have to make the decision again because people that don't like your decision are going to try to run other people for office and then we're going to get the instability of this decision making, which is no way to manage resources because we zig and we zag in very strange ways. So you've mentioned the, the phrase relevant stakeholders many times. And yes. And legally, we call it standing, as you have referenced. So um, I'm interested in how, as a negotiator, you determine, um, if you determine, who determines yeah. what leads to being relevant to the conversation and then you know, going to the subset group and appointing a leader to that. Right. And that reminds uh, me of my favorite yeah. phrase coming home from Israel is you put three Israelis in a negotiation and come out with seven opinions. Yeah. I'm not sure who right. got the fourth opinion on there, but uh, yeah. so I just wanted to get a uh, yeah. sure well, insight on that. Um, I, I will come in a minute to try to answering it in a generic way which is, uh, again, the kind of thing I said in here. But let me start with the specific case, right? And let me talk about Chile, since it's so fresh in my mind. So Chile is a country, it's the long skinny one on the left-hand side of Latin America. Chile is a country, um, less than 20 million people, is very long. It's a country with no oil, no gas, and no coal. Mm. And it's economy that's growing at between uh, 5 and 6% a year. It needs a lot of electricity. I can add one more fact. It gets 70% of its water glacially fed. So it gets 70%. I've read in one report of its water glacially fed, and the glaciers are in huge recession. Yeah. So you have no gas, no oil, no coal and you're growing, you used to depend on gas from your neighbor, Argentina, which has plenty of natural gas, and used to supply Chile with natural gas. But one day, Argentina said, we would like a little bit of space there at the end of the continent so we can have our own exit to the ocean. And Chile said no, and Argentina turned off the natural gas. <laughs> No notice, no warning, zero, none. Chile got very upset. They said, we're never going to depend on Argentina again. <laughs> it's like the U.S. saying, we can't possibly depend on the Middle East for oil. We have to be able to produce it all ourselves. So they decided, what else can they do? They're going to make a major investment in hydro. They have wonderful rivers. They have very powerful rivers. The problem is now that the growth is in the north, up in Santiago, and the rivers are in the south, where nobody is. And you're talking about 1,200 miles to send the electricity you're going to produce from these hydroelectric facilities. You're going to dissipate a huge amount of that electricity along the way. More significantly, to come to your stakeholder question, you're going to run these high tension lines through the lands of the Mapuche people, a million people out of 18 million in the country, and Chile doesn't bother to consult with anybody in this intervening space because, well, they're just Mapuche. And their status under the Constitution is they don't, it's very unclear. There have been several efforts to amend the law, and there are now current efforts afoot to try to revise the Constitution, but it's very unclear what their status is. And it's not like Canada. There's no reserve system. There are some Mapuche communities that have some land deeded to them by the government, but it's not even clear what title that, that constitutes. Now, Chile is a party to the ILO convention, and they signed it, 
and 169 of, says there needs to be consultation with indigenous people if the government's going to take action that affects them. Right? There was no consultation with the Mapuche. Now, one argument is, well, who speaks for Mapuche? It's really a whole different set of different communities, and it's not even clear that they're all one group, and who could speak for them anyway, and we're not going to talk. We can't do it. We're not going to bother with that. We're just going to go ahead and plan this gigantic transnational power line called the electric highway. Now, I would argue in the decision about energy policy in Chile, and of course now this also relates to a decision about water policy, because if you dam up all those rivers in Patagonia, you are affecting some of the world's most important natural resources, and you are dramatically altering the lands of people who live in that area, and Mapuche and otherwise, and you are in w fiddling in ways with the ecosystem that are hard to predict in terms of what's going to happen. Because you're, you're talking about damming up amazing rivers. Um, I mean, this does have the quality of a Chinese story in some respects, right? I mean, we talk about three gorges. This is the same scale. And no consultation with anybody? Now, admittedly, this is a country that was in a dictatorship. And while it's a democracy now, it's only more recently a democracy. And so the law is kind of fuzzy about what the democratic requirements are of consultation. They have an environmental impact assessment law. They did an impact assessment on the dams and not the power lines. Somebody just decided those are separate. We don't have to do that. Well, that was odd. They have an environmental impact assessment law that says it might take you seven years to produce this impact assessment, but there's only a 30-day period for all comments from the public once the impact assessment is published. They have an impact assessment law. It doesn't require any response to any of the comments received during the consultation period. What kind of environmental impact assessment law is that? They're very proud. It's their law. It's relatively recent. They didn't have anything. They're very happy they have an environmental impact assessment law. And I could go on with how energy decisions are made under the law in Chile and how water decisions are made. None of them would meet what most of us would say are the requirements of a democratic constitutional state. The parliament never got to vote on anything. The Supreme Court can be, it appears, overruled by presidential decree. <laughs> I mean, it's a very, as yet, not fully developed democracy, in my personal view. Now, I know Mapuche are stakeholders in this conversation, because they say they are. And just because there's no law requiring consultation with them, and because they don't have standing, because the law and the Constitution don't provide it, doesn't mean that any observer in the country or from outside who is trying to be uh, even-handed couldn't see that they're stakeholders. So there needs to be a process. Now I'm going from this case to the generic. There needs to be a process by which if a national government is going to make such a huge commitment, that groups like Mapuche, like local government leaders in the areas where the dams are proposed to be built, the no consultation with them about the granting of the water rights to, in this case, Norwegian entities that are going to build these giant dams if they get built. The Chinese wanted that contract, they didn't get it. Um, but there, there's no How could you argue that the local governments, where all this is going to happen, have, are not stakeholders? How could you argue that the private landowners, whose land in some cases will be confiscated, are not stakeholders? Now you could say, well, landowners can go to court. But it's not, it's not 
you can't say they're not stakeholders in the energy policy decision. I'm saying they're stakeholders in the d broader public policy decision. I'm not just talking about their standing and their rights relative to their property. And my sense is you need some procedure, which I describe in here, for an agency that has to make a policy decision to be held accountable for engaging, I would argue, a neutral party, a professional mediator, in going out and talking to groups who say they are stakeholders and summarizing and writing what all of those groups say and producing basically a map of who are the categories, what are the categories of stakeholders who claim to be stakeholders, what are their interests, imagine a matrix with categories of stakeholders down the side and issues across the top, and in each cell of the matrix, a sum, a summary of what this independent party found having private, not for attribution conversations with all groups who the neutral thought might have a stake or who said they wanted to be considered as stakeholders and you produce this matrix and then when I do this work I send the matrix to everybody I interviewed. So if I interview several hundred people representing 700 gr several hundred groups or categories and my matrix is they're basically ten categories of groups. Electric industry, electricity users, federal agencies, state or state agencies, environmental interests, or dark green or light green, or whatever categories you want to make. And I send that summary back to every group that we met with. Again, they're not quoted because the interviews are not for attribution. And we say in the cover note, do you see what you said in this matrix? And if we missed what you said, tell the neutral, not the government. And if we left out a group, tell us who else you think needs to be included. And this sort of bottom-up process, managed by a neutral, produces a proposal to the agency that has to make the policy, grant the license, or make the decision. And if it wants to have a consultative process, a joint problem-solving process, it now has a legitimate way of saying, well, these are the 15 categories, and the report from that neutral says these are the kinds of groups that need to be convened so that they can choose a representative in that category, and this would be the agenda, the issues across the top, and this is what the joint fact-finding process would cost, how long it would take, what it would look like, and these are the ground rules for the conversation. And that procedure, which we called stakeholder assessment, which is now codified and used by most of the multilateral agencies, when they're trying to figure out, in the, when the World Bank is challenged because it gave a grant someplace and the country used the money to build something and now they're shooting at the people who have come to build the thing, the copper mine, and the World Bank says, uh-oh, Maybe we missed a step. Maybe the national government that gave the concession to the company, the Canadian company that's doing the copper mining, should have talked to local people before they showed up there to start the mining. The, the bank hires us and says, is there some kind of consultative process even now we could have? And would you do a stakeholder assessment and figure out who should be invited to the table? And can we get all those parties to agree to that assessment, work plan, and ground rules, and then if so, we manage that process. We is a network of independent neutrals all around the world. You tell me the country, I'll tell you the professional neutrals that are available to do this work. And the bank, the World Bank, now is putting together this network. Here in this building, you have a similar effort that John ruge has been trying to do of creating a, a, a roster of neutrals to help on corporate community social engagement disputes anywhere in the world. We know who these professional neutrals are. It's not that they're politically neutral, it's that they have learned a practice of how to engage in these processes in a way that you are required to suppress 
whatever political bias you may have. And the way you know you've succeeded at it is that the parties accept you. If they throw you out, you're out. So if you want to do the work, you have to, in fact, convince the parties that you are not taking sides. And uh, I would argue in the same way that we can have soccer matches around the world or football matches and have referees, and they can come from a lot of different places. They're either a good referee or a bad referee. And if they happen to be taking the side of one country or the other, you throw them out as a referee. Well, we know how to do stakeholder assessment. And you can now see the practice of stakeholder assessment happening in a variety of quarters around the world. I would argue any major water resource allocation effort should be preceded by a stakeholder assessment leading to the creation of an entity representing all the different groups. Now, when I suggest this to my Palestinian and Israeli and Jordanian friends, they look at me like I'm from Mars, right? There's, there's no way, first of all, the argument is there's no way that an ad hoc entity like this would ever be allowed to make any kind of recommendations that national decision makers would take seriously. And then they say there's no way that you could get fair representation of all the different interests on all sides. And then they would argue that there's too much unevenness in the resources available to the participant groups, even if I got them there, to be able to participate in the joint fact-finding process on an even basis. And then their assumption is, as you implied by the comment you made, even if I succeeded in getting them there, gave them the resources to participate in joint fact-finding, produced forecasts and analyses that they all bought into, they never grant anything anyway, <laughs> right? Now, I know that's not true because I work in that region, and we have all kinds of examples at the local level of negotiated agreements in spite of the ongoing battles. And the reason I was so excited about the Israeli-Jordanian treaty negotiation is that treaty was negotiated during a, a state of war. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're at war, but we have to figure out what's happening to this water. So we need to have some procedure for making an agreement even in, in the face of the larger unresolved political battle. So I am convinced that this could happen. Well, you just hinted at it now, but could you provide an example of um, a situation where water diplomacy worked, particularly around the government's principles and structures you've been describing? Yeah. So in the water diplomacy book, um, there are 103 uh, excerpts from printed material around the world which where there are accounts of uh, how different aspects of what I've described have been handled in other places and in the Aquapedia there are very detailed accounts of things uh, of aspects of water disputes being handled in the way I'm describing um, so that I I'm going to give you one or two examples that are I think quite interesting and we have and, and this is true both domestically as well as as internationally right you mentioned California, but if we, if we look at the Colorado uh, and we look at the ongoing battles for however long you know, people have been writing about managing the Colorado, or we look at um, the, the issues uh, uh, in the southeast in the United States, uh, the ACF as it's called, I can't say uh, quickly the names of the three rivers that AC and F stand for because it's Chattahoochee and it's Apalachicola and it's very complicated. But 25 years that dispute's been up and down the court system. They can't agree on how to allocate the water. And finally we see opportunities to begin to move in the direction I'm describing when things get bad enough. So we have had some successful rewriting of the rules of allocating the water between California and Colorado and the, and the other southwestern states because federal officials intervened and said, if you guys can't reach an agreement yourselves, we are going to have to impose new rules. 
And that was, with a lot of help and a lot of agony, they in fact succeeded in doing that. And so we have in the aftermath of certain long-standing conflicts some capacity to do this. If you look at the Mekong, and there are very detailed examples in, in the book, you have parts of the system where there was stakeholder engagement and agreement on what to do. Now, China's never fully bought into being part of the Mekong Commission, even though it goes to all the meetings and tells everybody what to do, it refuses to formally become a member. Uh, but in the portion south of the Mekong, um, you can see these stories of collaborative efforts involving stakeholders in reaching agreement. And we have examples uh, throughout Africa. Again, smaller scale, not the Nile, certainly. There's been horrible inability to manage the Nile collaboratively with all of the riparian states. And now they can't even meet because the rules of the game are Sudan gets one vote. And there's no capacity to change the rules of the game in the rules of the game. And so, well, if Sudan gets one vote, then Sudan's not coming because there are two groups that think they're Sudan and that they should each get a vote. And the system won't accommodate it. And so, I mean, so the, the Nile, not a great example of, of how those countries can get together. But you do have examples at smaller river scales in Africa of stakeholders being engaged in discussions about decisions to how much water will go for residential use, how much for industrial use, and how much for farming. It's a big, it's a big issue, right? And those decisions, to, if they're going to be stable, need to be credible to the groups that have to live with the result, and they're not going to be credible anymore, not just because there's cell phones, but because democracies have evolved unless they involve those stakeholders in the discussions. And I don't mean just telling them what's been decided at a meeting. I mean engaging them before the decision is made. And, you know, uh, you can look in South Asia and you can say, well, for an awfully long time they managed the Indus, even though there were competing interests that's falling apart at the moment, but there were an awfully long period of time uh, in which competing interests were in fact engaged in managing the resource together and there has to be in the future attention to how different interests within India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Afghanistan are going to manage water and then if you look around um, uh, take whichever river system you want whether it's the Mediterranean or whether it's the, uh, the Danube, the riparian countries cannot have two powerful heads of state meet in a room and decide what the new system is for managing the water when there isn't as much water because climate change has changed it. There's going to be a process of engagement and there has to be a method of doing it so that the parties that are stakeholders somehow have a chance to say who's at the table and that those stakeholders have a chance somehow to engage in joint fact-finding so we avoid everybody having their own advocate arguing scientific support for a pre-made political position. And there has to be some way of getting those parties to take responsibility not just for their interests but for the interests of the others with competing concerns being met, which is what joint fact-finding is like. And there has to be some way of taking that, all that work, which costs money and takes time, be presented to those with the formal authority to decide. It's still their decision. And if they left groups out, those groups should have a chance to petition the formal authority, say, I don't, you may have had some great process, but you left me out. And that would be a reason for the elected officials to say thank you for your proposal but we're going to do something a little different so we need to but we need to have a method of moving those things forward and we can see evidence of moves in that direction in different places not any place I can point to that's done everything I've described 
but a lot more of an effort to engage stakeholders in joint fact-finding and some effort at joint problem-solving some agencies <laughs> saying it's not demeaning to my authority to consult before I've made the decision. Not a, not a lot, some. So uh, we were been involved in Vietnam, we've been involved in Ghana. Um, decisions about uh, uh, energy policy, decisions about water policy, which have been made at the, in a centralized, top-down way, there, there has to be, there's, it's inevitable that there will be more of an opening up and moving in this other direction. Every place is going to go at a different rate. It's going to be fits and starts. A lot is going to depend on leadership at the top in those different countries. But uh, I, I I can't point to an ideal case where everything I described has been done, either domestically or internationally. But I see enough consternation with the current way of doing it, and I see enough evidence of pieces of what I've described being possible to be optimistic. Might be a great place to stop. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't. Want, I'm worried about you all. I live in town. I don't. I just got on the tea. I don't. I'll, 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 I'll let the group go because it's a, it's more of an observation than what I'm talking about. Well, welcome to the day. Embarrassing. <laughs> so I want to make sure, Larry. Thank you so much. And sure. Really appreciate sure. it.